This is part 5 of Dimensions, a casebook of alien contact. A book by Jacques Vallée. Please listen with an open mind. Thank you for listening. The 16 Conclusions of Reverend Kirk In the last half of the 17th century, a Scottish scholar gathered all the accounts he could find about the Slimate and, in 1691, wrote an amazing manuscript entitled The Secret Commonwealth of Elves, Fawns, and Fairies. It was the first systematic attempt to describe the methods and organization of the strange creatures that plagued the farmers of Scotland. The author, Reverend Kirk, of Aberfoyle, studied theology at St. Andrews and took his degree of professor at Edinburgh. Later he served as minister for the parishes of Balketer and Aberfoyle and died in 1692. Kirk invented the name The Secret Commonwealth to describe the organization of the elves. It is impossible to quote the entire text of his treatise, but we can summarize his findings about elves and other aerial creatures in the following way, they have a nature that is intermediate between man and the angels. Physically, they have very light and fluid bodies, which are comparable to a condensed cloud. They are particularly visible at dusk. They can appear and vanish at will. Intellectually, they are intelligent and curious. They have the power to carry away anything they like. They live inside the earth in caves, which they can reach through any crevice or opening where air passes. When men did not inhabit most of the world, the creatures used to live there and had their own agriculture. Their civilization has left traces on the high mountains, it was flourishing at a time when the whole countryside was nothing but woods and forests. At the beginning of each three-month period, they change quarters because they are unable to stay in one place. Besides, they like to travel. It is then that men have terrible encounters with them, even on the great highways. Their chameleon-like bodies allow them to swim through the air with all their household. They are divided into tribes. Like us, they have children, nurses, marriages, burials, etc., unless they just do this to mock our own customs or to predict terrestrial events. Their houses are said to be wonderfully large and beautiful, but under most circumstances they are invisible to human eyes. Kirk compares them to enchanted islands. The houses are equipped with lamps that burn forever and fires that need no fuel. They speak very little. When they do talk among themselves, their language is a kind of whistling sound. Their habits and their language when they talk to humans are similar to those of local people. Their philosophical system is based on the following ideas, nothing dies, all things evolve cyclically in such a way that at every cycle they are renewed and improved. Motion is the universal law. They are said to have a hierarchy of leaders, but they have no visible devotion to God, no religion. They have many pleasant and light books, but also serious and complex books dealing with abstract matters. They can be made to appear at will before us through magic. The similarities between these observations and the story related by Facius Cardan, which antedates Kirk's manuscript by exactly 200 years, are clear. Both Cardan and Paracelsus write, like Kirk, that a pact can be made with these creatures and that they can be made to appear and answer questions at will. Paracelsus did not care to reveal what that pact was because of the ills that might befall those who would try it. Kirk is equally discreet on this point. And, of course, to go deeper into this matter would open the whole field of witchcraft and ceremonial magic, which is beyond my purpose in the present book. Kirk's conclusion is that every age has left a secret to be discovered. Sooner than we think, he says, the relations with the aerial beings will be as natural to us as, say, the printing press or navigation, all things that caused considerable surprise when they were first introduced. We can only follow him in this and give a humble salute to a man who managed to gather such a complete description of our strange visitors. It is remarkable that one cannot find a single writer who claims he knows the physical nature of the creatures. They give us their personal opinions or report on the various theories held during their time, but they do not assure us they have a final answer. To Kirk, the good people have bodies so pliable through the subtlety of the spirits that agitate them, that they can make them appear or disappear at pleasure. Some have bodies or vehicles so spongious, thin, and defecate, that they are fed by only sucking into some fine spirituous liquors, that pierce like pure air and oil. According to medieval occultists, all invisible beings can be divided into four classes, the angels, 
the gods of the ancients, the devils or demons, the fallen angels, the souls of the dead, and the elemental spirits, which correspond to Kirk's secret commonwealth. In the fourth group are the gnomes, who inhabit the earth and correspond to mind-haunting fairies, goblins, pixies, corrigans, leprechauns, and the domovoys of Russian legends, and the sylphs, who inhabit the air. These subdivisions are obviously arbitrary, and Paracelsus himself would admit it is extremely difficult to provide definitions for these various classes. The bodies of the elementals are of an elastic semi-material essence, ethereal enough so as not to be detected by the physical sight, and they may change their forms according to certain laws. From John MacNeil of Barra, Evans once learned, the old people said they didn't know if fairies were flesh and blood or spirits. They saw them as men of more diminutive stature than our own race. I heard my father say that fairies used to come and speak to natural people and then vanish while one was looking at them. Fairy women used to go into houses and talk and then vanish. The general belief was that the fairies were spirits who could make themselves seen or not seen at will. And when they took people they took body and soul together. Another man interviewed by Evans once insisted that the fairies of the air are different from those in the rocks. Similarly, in Brittany, popular tradition divides the fairies into two groups, pygmy-sized entities endowed with magic powers and the science of prophecy, and white, aerial fairies. Beings in the first category are black, hairy, their hands terminate in talons. They have old faces and hollow eyes, small and bright like burning coals. Their voices are low as if broken by age. With the remark about prophecy, we are back to the relationship between the actions of the secret commonwealth and human affairs. Evans Wentz, quoting ancient poetry, says that during the last fight of the great hero of Ulster, Cúhalan, who was a favorite of the Sheetha, or fairies, one of these beings named Morgu flew over Cúhalan's head as he fought in his war chariot. Similarly, the fairies took part in the Battle of Clontarf, April 23, 1014, providing what would be called, in modern military language, air cover for the Irish side. Before the battle, a fairy woman came to Dunlongo Hardigan and begged him not to fight, she knew the issue could only be death, and here we find the prophetic powers of fairies again. He assured her that he was ready to die for Ireland. As translated by W. H. Hennessy in Review Celt, the two armies met near Dublin, it will be one of the wonders of the Day of Judgment to relate the description of this tremendous onset. There arose a wild, impetuous, mad, inexorable, furious, dark, lacerating, merciless, combative, contentious bothab which was shrieking and fluttering over their heads. And there arose also the satyrs and sprites, and destroying demons of the air and firmament, and the demoniac phantom host. Can we study modern UFO reports without reopening the entire problem of apparitions? To most UFO writers, the answer is yes. Unidentified flying objects, they argue, leave physical traces and behave like space probes. It is obvious to them that UFOs are scientific devices having nothing to do with the mystico-religious context of medieval apparitions, and nothing to do with the creatures studied by Kirk, since, as we have just seen, these latter could appear and vanish at will. This view is no longer tenable. Reports of many recent observations do describe objects that appear and vanish. It is just that such reports are not publicized. Students of UFOs are still reluctant to publish them. And the witnesses themselves are not eager to come forward with stories they know are unbelievable. During a discussion I had with Amy Michelle on this subject, Michelle pointed out the negative reactions of scientists to his analysis of the French sightings. They argued that such fantastic stories could only come from deranged minds. What would these scientists have said, he remarked, if I had published all the data. Among the cases that deserve close examination, but which were swept under the rug by UFO believers themselves, is the sighting at Water, France, on September 30, 1954. About 4.30 p.m. Georges Gaete, head of a team of eight construction workers, found himself walking away from the others. He felt a peculiar drowsiness and suddenly wondered where he was going. Then, without warning, he faced the strangest apparition. Less than 30 feet away, above him on the slope, was a man. His head was covered by an opaque glass helmet with a visor coming down to his chest. 
He wore gray coveralls and short boots. In his hand he held an elongated object, it could have been a pistol, or it could have been a metal rod. On his chest was a light projector. The strange man was standing in front of a large shining dome, which floated about three feet above the ground. Above the cupola of the machine were objects like rotating wings or blades. Then, suddenly, the strange man vanished, and I couldn't explain how he did, since he did not disappear from my field of vision by walking away, but vanished like an image one erases suddenly. Then I heard a strong whistling sound which drowned the noise of our excavators, the saucer rose by successive jerks, in a vertical direction, and then it too was erased in a sort of blue haze, as if by miracle. Gaete tried to run, but he found himself helplessly nailed to the spot. He was thus paralyzed during the whole observation. So were seven co-workers, in a unique case of collective physiological reaction. None of them had previously believed in the reality of the so-called saucers. As soon as he was able to move again, Gaete rushed back to his men and cried, Have you seen something? Mr. Buroys told him, Yes, a flying saucer. And the man who was the driver of the excavator, Mr. Lubinovic, added, There was a man dressed like a diver in front of it. Four others, Messrs. Sechet, Villeneuve, Rougier, and Amirout, a truck driver, confirmed the details of the sighting. It must be pointed out that the incident took place in a remote rural region. At the time the wave of French reports was just beginning. But Gaete, who fought during the war with the resistance and was wounded in Luxembourg, stated that he was not used to flights of fancy. Following the incident, he suffered from insomnia, strong headaches, and loss of appetite for a week. Ironically, the eight men are still not convinced that the flying saucers were alien. They feel sure they are a secret development by a terrestrial nation, probably France. In Jalapa, Mexico, early in September 1965, a hovering object was seen with luminous slits in its circumference and a black-clad being, with eyes gleaming like cat's eyes, holding a shining metal rod. The entity vanished suddenly while under observation in a Jalapa street by a local reporter, two taxi drivers, and a bullfighter. In the car seen you, Brazil, case of July 26, 1965, five dwarfs dressed in dark uniforms and small boots were seen. We are told that one of them had in his right hand a brilliantly luminous object like a wand. There was a sudden flash of lightning about 1.45 p.m. on January 28, 1967, on Studham Common, near Whipsnade Park Zoo, an isolated spot in the Chiltern Hills in England. Rain was falling and the atmosphere was heavy, reports English researcher R.H.B. Winder, who investigated this case for the Flying Saucer Review. Seven boys were on their way to school in the vicinity of the Dell, a shallow valley and an ideal spot for playing hide-and-seek. Alex Butler, age 10, was looking south over the Dell when he saw clearly, in the open, a little blue man with a tall hat and a beard. Alex called his friend, and they ran toward the figure. They were about 20 yards away when it disappeared in a puff of smoke. The boys were very much surprised, naturally, but nothing in the attitude of the strange figure had inspired fear or suggested threat, so they kept looking for the little blue man and saw him again on the opposite side of the bushes from where he was first standing. They went toward him. He vanished once more, reappearing at the bottom of the dell. This time, they heard voices in nearby bushes and became slightly afraid. The voices reminded them of foreign-sounding babble. Finally, they saw the man a fourth time before they were summoned to school by the whistle. Their teacher, Miss Newcomb, noticed how excited they were and, in spite of their warnings that she would never believe them, immediately separated them and made each of the seven boys write down his experience in his own words. The essays were then gathered into a book called The Little Blue Man on Studham Common, which notes Winder, makes fascinating reading and no doubt will occupy an honored place in the archives of the Studham Village Primary School. Investigation disclosed a number of local sightings, among them two landings in the vicinity of the spot, within a few months of the January sighting. Naturally, the investigators were most interested in hearing the boys themselves give details on the appearance of the creature. Winder reports, they estimate the little man at three feet tall, by comparison with themselves, with an additional two feet accounted for by a hat or helmet best described as a tall brimless bowler, 
i.e., with a rounded top. The blue color turned out to be a dim grayish blue glow tending to obscure outline and detail. They could, however, discern a line which was either a fringe of hair or the lower edge of the hat, two round eyes, a small seemingly flat triangle in place of a nose, and a one-piece vestment extending down to a broad black belt carrying a black box at the front about six inches square. The arms appeared short and were held straight down close to the side at all times. The legs and feet were indistinct. As for the puff of smoke, it apparently was a whirling cloud of yellowish-blue mist shot toward the pursuers. The magic casement, the Reverend Robert Kirk makes no bones about it, the elves did at one time occupy the land. Today it is still a common belief in the north of Scotland that the Sith or fairy people existed once, a belief that survives in their title good neighbors, although they could also be hostile to man, while the Sith had no inborn antagonism towards human beings and were occasionally known to do good turns to their favorites, they were very quick to take offense, capricious in their behavior and delighted in playing tricks on their mortal neighbors. These cantrips had to be patiently endured, as resistance or hostility might lead to dreadful reprisals, the kidnapping of children or even adults. An attitude of passive friendliness on the human side was therefore assumed to be eminently desirable. Sir Walter Scott refers to this when Bailey Nicole Jarvie, in Rob Roy, tells his companion, as they pass a fairy hill near Aberfoyle, they see a them. Dina Sith, which signifies, as I understand, men of peace, meaning thereby to make their goodwill. And we may e'en as well see a them that too, Mr. Oswald a stone, for there's nae good a in speaking ill of the laird within his ain bounds. A Gaelic scholar, Campbell, minister of Tari, published a story called Navushian, the Dwarfs of Pygmies, in which he remarks, the existence of pygmies in some unknown region bordering upon, if not forming part of, the kingdom of coldness is of interest as indicating some of the connection between smallness of person and cold climate, and so leading to the speculations as to the first dispersion of the human race and connection of tribes that are now far removed from each other in appearance, dress, mode of life, and dialects. Although the connection between climate and size is not very tenable, Campbell's remarks do open the way to interesting speculations. He notes that the term Labnich applies to a certain little, thick-set, insignificant man who figures in many tales, and he adds, there are many traditional tales in the highlands of much interest, in which little men of dwarfish, and even pygmy size, figure as good bowmen, slaying men of large size, and powerful make, by their dexterity in the use of the bow and arrow. In spite of their small size, they are understood to have been of very considerable strength. They were not undersized in the same way that children are, but full-grown individuals, undersized and sinewy, or muscular. These dwarfs or pygmies are called Navushian or, more correctly, na h -Vushian. The English phonetics for the Gaelic visk would be a whisk. The same beings are sometimes found under the names Tazg and Vuish, and these words uniformly designate dwarfs. It is ironic. Therefore, that in one tale, the lad with the skin garments, quoted by folklore researcher McDougall, the Osk address a human intruder as a little man while he in turn calls them big men all. Were there or were there not races of dwarfs living among the West and Middle Europeans of antiquity? Were the legends about the fairies and the elves based on the fact that the ancient inhabitants of the northern parts of the British Isles were such a race? Historical and archaeological researchers definitely say no. Yet several writers, such as folklore scholar David McCritchie, claim there are indications in this direction. In Tyson's essay concerning the pygmies of the ancients, published in London in 1894, Professor Wendell, of Birmingham, remarks that a race of dwarfs supplied the best warriors and bodyguards of several kings. Tyson made an extensive study of the dwarf races and quotes the Greek historian Tejas, Middle India has black men, who are called pygmies using the same language as the other Indians. Of these pygmies, the king of the Indians has 3,000 in his train, for they are very skillful archers. And he adds, there seem to have been near Lake Zara, in Persia, Negrito, pygmy black, tribes who are probably aboriginal, and may have formed the historic black guard of the ancient kings of Susania. Tyson's work, to which Wendell provided the preface, was written in the 17th century. After calling attention to the remark by Tejas, it goes on, 
Talentonius and Bartholin think that what Tejas relates of the pygmies, as their being very good archers, very well illustrates this text of Ezekiel. The Ezekiel text in question appears thus in the King James Bible, The men of Arvad with thine army were upon thy walls round about, and the Gamadims were in thy towers. And indeed, the English Bishop's Bible of 1572 and 1575 does not have Gamadims but Pygmenians. Without going into further detail, it is clear that the Gaelic story of a guard of dwarf warriors is not an isolated case. If we return now to David McRitchie's quotation from the Flemish folklore journal on Svoksleven, we can learn more. The Finlanders, a race dwelling in our country prior to the Celts, were little, but strong, dexterous, and good swimmers, they lived by hunting and fishing. Adam of Bremen in the 11th century thus pictures their descendants or race, they had large heads, flat faces, flat noses, and large mouths. They lived in caves of rocks, which they quitted in the night time for the purpose of committing sanguinary outrages. The Celtic people, and later those of German race, so tall and strong, could hardly look upon such little folk as human beings. They must have regarded them as strange, mysterious creatures. And when these Negroes or Finlanders had lived for a long enough time hidden, for fear of the new people, in their grottoes, especially when they at length fell into decay through poverty, or died out, they became changed in the imagination of the dreamy Germans into mysterious beings, a kind of ghosts or gods. In a footnote, McCritchy states that he is not aware on what grounds this author speaks of them as black people, but he admits that these dwarfish Finlanders might be regarded as the originals of the Osks of the Gaelic legend. A tradition in the Orkney Isles offers a parallel to the above story. Sometime in the first part of the 15th century, Bishop Thomas Tullock of Orkney gave details, in De Orchidibus Insulus, of the tradition that the archipelago had been inhabited six centuries earlier by the Pape and a race of dwarfs. The Pape were the Irish priests, and the dwarfs were the Picts. In this, McCritchie follows Barry's Orkney, where we read, they are plainly no other than the Piaths, Picts, or Pikes. The Scandinavian writers generally call the Pikes petty, or pets, one of them uses the term pedia, instead of Pickland, Soxogram, and besides, the firth that divides Orkney from Caithness is usually denominated Petland Fjord in the Icelandic sagas of histories. The consistency running through these ancient accounts, McCritchie says, is indeed remarkable. The Irish priests followed St. Columba, who himself was a great-grandson of Conal Gulban, who, tradition states, had fierce battles with a race of dwarfs. Conal Gulban's fights with the dwarfs indeed are the origin of a series of tales sometimes attributed to other legendary heroes. If we try to get as close as possible to the original story, this is what we get, According to J.F. Campbell of Isla, Conal Gulban was the son of the famous Neil, the ancestor of the O'Neills of Ulster. He was the great-grandfather of St. Columba. His adventures begin in the northwest of Ireland, somewhere in the dawn of the 5th century. After various experiences, Gulban landed in the realm of Lachlan, generally believed to be Scandinavia, which itself had a rather vague meaning at the time. There Gulban was intrigued by a strange construction and asked his guide, what pointed house is there? That is the house of the Tvesk, the best warriors that are in the realm of Lachlan, the guide replied. I heard my grandfather speaking about the Tvesk, said Connell, but I have never seen them. I will go to see them. It were not my counsel to thee. Were the guide's last words. This advice, naturally, Connell Gulban disregarded. He went straight to the palace of the king of Lachlan and challenged him to combat. He was told, as recorded by Campbell of Isla, he should get no fighting at that time of night, but he should get lodging in the house of the Umhusk, Osks, where there were 1800 Umhusk, and 18 score. He went, and he went in, and there were none of the Vuish within that did not grin. When he saw that they had made a grin, he himself made two. What was the meaning of your grinning at us? Said the Umhusk. What was the meaning of your grinning at me? Said Connell. Said they, our grinning at thee meant that thy fresh royal blood will be ours to quench our thirst, and thy fresh royal flesh to polish our teeth. And, said Connell, the meaning of my grinning is, that I will look out for the one with the biggest knob and slenderest shanks, and knock out the brains of the rest with that one, and his brains with the knobs of the rest. 
Evidently, the little men of that particular time and place had not yet invented their paralyzing ray. The tale of Connell Gulban, recorded by Campbell of Isla in West Highland Tales, continues with many wonderful fights in other lands. In France, for example, Connell wins in the same absurd way over the House of the Tvesk, the best warriors that the King of France had. Mukherjee concluded, it is of course to be understood that the passage as it stands is as impossible as it is ludicrous. But this does not interfere with the assumption that the basis of the story may be an actual encounter between men of tall stature and a race of dwarfs, the excessive number of the latter, and the ease with which the hero swings them about, being merely the embroidering of tale-tellers in later times. As for the seeming impossibility that a tale could be transmitted for 15 centuries and yet be historical, McCritchie adds, it ought to be remembered that the oral transmission of history and genealogy, with the most careful attention to language and details, was a perfect science among the Gaelic-speaking peoples. But, then, what became of the dwarfish race? According to McCritchie in Scott's Lore, 1895, the dwarfs were destroyed or went into hiding toward the 6th century, when Columba and his followers carried on a religious war against the Picts. At the same time, he says, the Irishmen were also using force against the same people in the north of Ireland. And since the new owners of the land felt for their ancient enemies a mixture of guilt and fear, numerous rumors were born concerning the ghosts of the Picts, still roaming through the land. And this in turn led to the elves and fairies. This theory, generally referred to as the pygmy theory, is no longer tenable in the face of the evidence historians have gathered about the Picts. The name Picti, according to Wainwright in The Problem of the Picts, 1955, appears first in 297 AD, and from that time on, it is applied to all the peoples who lived north of the Antonine Wall and were not Scots. We are really concerned with the predecessors of the Picts, who formed various groups called Proto-Picts. Could McCritchie's pygmies have figured among the Proto-Picts? Should we believe that, among the Proto-Picts, there were dwarfs who were mistaken for a native people? And, then, where did they come from? McCritchie's theory offers only confusion, and it is amusing to observe his embarrassment when he must report that the Fenlanders were not only dwarfish, but black, too. Could it be that there were oracles in Northern Europe at the dawn of recorded history? In his conclusion to his discussion of the pygmy theory, which he rejects as Hartland does, Evans Wentz remarks that it leaves all the problems of the historical origins of the fairy faith unsolved since it is clearly global, not limited to the Celtic lands. Thus A. Lang, in his introduction to the 1922 edition of Kirk's book, states that to my mind at least, the subterranean inhabitants of Mr. Kirk's book are not so much a traditional recollection of a real dwarfish race living underground, a hypothesis of Sir Walter Scott's, as a lingering memory of the Thonian beings, the ancestors. Folklore in the Making no matter how interesting it may be to speculate on the origin of these ancient beliefs, the opportunity to observe folklore in the making is even more attractive. When modern rumors fall into the very same patterns that have puzzled generations of scientists, theologians, and literary scholars, the feeling one gets is a mixture of wonder and delight. When the phone rings in Wright-Patterson Air Force Base and a local intelligence office transmits the observation of a motorist who has just seen what he describes as a flying saucer with strange hairy dwarfs on the side of the road, we are witnessing the unique conjunction of the modern world, with its technology, and ancient terrors with all the power of their sudden, fugitive, irrational nature. We are in a very privileged position. Neither Evans Wentz nor Hartland was able to interview people who had just observed the phenomena they studied. Most of their witnesses spoke of days gone by, of stories heard by the fireplace. In contrast, we feel that we can almost reach out into the night and grab those lurking entities. We are hot on their trail, the air is still vibrating with excitement, the smell of sulfur is still there when the story is recorded. Take, for instance, the story of the Air Force Colonel who was driving at night on a lonely Illinois road when he noticed a strange object was flying above his car. It looked, he said, like a bird, but it was the size of a small airplane. It flapped its wings and flew away. This is the type of horror story adolescents sometimes tell when they come home late and a bit nervous. But an Air Force Colonel. During November and December, 1966, 
West Virginia was plagued by a similar bird, called the Mothman by imaginative reporters. One witness, 25-year-old Thomas Urey, who lives in Clarksburg, met the creature at 7.15 a.m. on November 25, 1966, in the vicinity of Point Pleasant. It was a large gray thing that rose from a nearby field. It came up like a helicopter and veered over my car, Yuri told American researcher John Keel, a dedicated investigator who spent many days in the area analyzing the reports. Yuri accelerated up to 75 miles per hour, but the bird was still there, casually circling the car. It appeared to be about 6 feet long, with a wing spread of 8 to 10 feet. According to other witnesses quoted by Keel, the figure had large, round, glowing red eyes. On January 11, 1967, Mrs. McDaniel saw the bird herself in broad daylight. She was outside her home when she observed what appeared to be a small plane flying down the road almost at treetop level. As it drew close she realized it was a man-shaped object with wings. It swooped low over her head and circled a nearby restaurant before going out of sight. Mrs. McDaniel is known in the community as a rational and responsible person. Now consider this report, the intruder was tall, thin and powerful. He had a prominent nose, and bony fingers of immense power which resembled claws. He was incredibly agile. He wore a long, flowing cloak, of the sort affected by opera goers, soldiers and strolling actors. On his head was a tall, metallic seeming helmet. Beneath the cloak were close-fitting garments of some glittering material like oilskin or metal mesh. There was a lamp strapped to his chest. Oddest of all, the creature's ears were cropped or pointed like those of an animal. Was it a prankster in Batman dress? It seems entirely possible, especially when we take into account the fact that the bird was carrying something on its back and made incredible leaps, actually flying on one occasion. There is only one trouble with this explanation, the latter episode took place not in West Virginia in 1966 but in the dark lanes of a London suburb in November 1837. Like the Mothman of Point Pleasant, the mysterious Flying Man of London was ignored by authorities as long as possible. Finally, a resident of Peckham wrote a letter to the Lord Mayor, and the censorship could no longer be maintained. Nightly, horse patrols searched the countryside, Admiral Codrington set up a reward fund, still unclaimed, by the way. And J. Viner, in a remarkable article about the mystery, informs us that even the old Duke of Wellington himself set holsters at his saddle bow and rode out after dark in search of spring Hill Jack. On February 20, 1838, a woman of 18, Jane Alsop of Old Ford, London, heard a violent ringing of the front doorbell. Going out, she faced the most hideous appearance of spring Hill Jack. He wore shining garments and a flashing lamp on his chest. His eyes resembled glowing balls of fire. When Miss Alsop uttered a cry, the intruder grabbed her arm in claw-like fingers, but her sister rushed to her rescue. The visitor spurted a fiery gas in Jane's face, and she dropped unconscious. Then Jack fled, dropping his cloak, which was picked up at once by another shadow who ran after him. Two days earlier, though not revealed until after the old Ford incident had made headlines, a Miss Scales, of Limehouse, was walking through Green Dragon Alley. The alley was a dim lit passage beside a public house, and when she saw a tall figure lurking in the shadows Miss Scales hesitated, waiting for her sister who had fallen behind. The sister, who described the loiterer as tall, thin and, save the mark, gentlemanly, came up in time to see his long cloak thrown aside, and a lantern flashing on the startled girl. There was no time to scream, Jack's weird blue flame spurted into his victim's face and she dropped to the ground in a deep swoon. Whereupon, Jack walked away calmly. Viner suggests that Jack had a rendezvous in Green Dragon Alley and wanted to get rid of witnesses. A week after the Old Ford incident, he knocked on the door of Mr. Ashworth's house in Turner Street and inquired for him. The servant who opened the door screamed. Jack fled. He was never seen again, in the London neighborhood at least. Had a contact been made? It is strange indeed, as Viner remarks, that spring -Heel Jack should have paid two visits within two days to houses less than a mile apart, whose owners were named Alsop and Ashworth, respectively. Two of the main witnesses, as in West Virginia, were young women. 
with them, in the two cases, were their sisters. There seems to be a pattern here. But, rather typically, it is once again an absurd one. In 1877, wearing tight garments and shining helmet, Jack was seen again at Aldershot, Hampshire, England. On that occasion he flew above two sentries, who fired at him. He answered with a burst of blue fire, which left them stunned, and vanished. Viner believes that Jack was again to blame for the scare in late August 1944, in Mattoon, Illinois. He was seen at night peering through windows as in search for someone known to him by sight. Most of the witnesses were women, some of them reported falling unconscious after a device was pointed at them by the visitor, who left a strange cloying smell. In the spring of 1960, Italian jeweler Salvatore Cianci was driving in Sicily, near Syracuse, when a small being in shining clothes wearing a diving helmet appeared in the beam of the headlights. It had no arms but two little wings. Mr. Chanchi suffered a nervous shock. On Saturday, November 16, 1963, four teenagers were walking near Sadling Park, near Hythe, Kent, England. One of the four, 17-year-old John Flaxton, describes how they were frightened by an object they first had taken to be a star, it was uncanny. The reddish-yellow light was coming out of the sky at an angle of 60 degrees. As it came towards the ground it seemed to hover more slowly. A bright golden light suddenly appeared in the field near them, after the first object had been hidden by some trees, it was about 80 yards away, floating about 10 feet above the ground. It seemed to move along with us, stopping when we stopped as if it was observing us. The light was oval, about 15 to 20 feet across with a bright, solid core. It disappeared behind trees and a few seconds later a dark figure shambled out. It was all black, about the size of a human but without a head. It seemed to have wings like a bat on either side and came stumbling towards us. We didn't wait to investigate. Folklore in the making. From the Farfadets, we have drifted to modern times, with spring Jack and the Moth Man. And we have seen our visitor's arsenal become more precise. Jack's lantern and ray gun have survived in modern tales, in 20th century comic books, in television series. But the real question is, could all this be real? And, if not, how can we explain the consistency of these descriptions, at a time when there were no comics and no television? The Italian artist R.L. Johannes had a remarkable experience in 1947, at a time when the name Flying Saucer was already popular in the United States but when documentation about landings was non-existent. The date was August 14th. He was hiking alone, following a small stream in the mountainous region between Italy and Yugoslavia. Among some rocks, he suddenly saw a large, brilliant red, lens-shaped object, about 10 yards in diameter. Close to it, he discovered two people, whom he first regarded as kids until he realized they were dwarfs, of a type he had never seen before. The two beings were under three feet tall, their heads were larger than a man's head. They had no hair, eyelashes, or eyebrows. Their faces were greenish, their noses straight, their mouths wide slits, giving them something of the appearance of a fish. Their eyes were huge, round, and prominent, their color yellow-green. The skin around their eyes formed rings rather than eyelids. As Johannes moved, one of the beings touched his belt. At once from the center of the belt something like a ray and a puff of vapor were emitted. Johannes experienced an electrical discharge and found himself on the ground, helpless, and very weak. It took all his energy to turn his head and observe the two beings as they walked away. A moment later they were gone. In 1965 a case very similar to Johannes's was reported to the U.S. Air Force. Dr. J. Allen Hynek and I tried in vain to get an active investigation of it by Project Blue Book, the U.S. Air Force's investigations of UFO sightings in the 1960s. Finally the case was leaked, at my suggestion, to a civilian group which conducted a speedy and careful study of the testimony given by the only witness, a Mr. S. The details of the testimony are now aviable in an excellent book by the leaders of the civilian group, the Lorenzans. Called by the Lorenzans the most spectacular report we have examined, the incident took place on September 4, 1964, in the mountains of Northern California, about 8 miles from Cisco Grove. 
Mr. S was hunting when he became separated from the hunting party and lost his way. Night was falling, so he lit some fires to show his position. Soon he observed a light in the sky, which he thought was a helicopter looking for him. When it stopped and hovered silently nearby, however, he realized it was an unusual object and climbed a large tree to observe from that vantage point. The light circled the tree. He saw a flash and a dark object falling to the ground. Next he noticed one figure crashing through the woods below him and another moving in from a slightly different direction. Both figures approached the tree and looked at him. They were a little over five feet tall, the witness estimates, and clothed in a silvery uniform that covered their heads. A third creature appeared later, behaving more like a mechanical being than an animal or man. It was darker and had two reddish-orange eyes. It had no mouth, but rather a slit-like opening that would drop open like an oven door. For the rest of the time Mr. S was conscious, the entities used a variety of means to try to get him to fall from the tree. He managed to keep them away by throwing lighted bits of paper and clothing at them, to which they reacted in fear. The main weapon used against him was a very curious one. If we are to believe this report, the robot-like entity would let its lower jaw drop, then place its hand inside the rectangular cavity thus revealed, and emit a puff of smoke in Mr. S's direction. The smoke spread like a mist and, upon reaching him, made him lose consciousness. The effects of it was comparable to being suddenly deprived of oxygen, Mr. S said. The story is hard to believe, would not such beings be able to climb a tree? If they came out of a flying saucer, why could they not fly up to his refuge? But it is equally difficult to prove that Mr. S simply had a nightmare. The witness is not given to such behavior, and when he woke up at dawn, still tied to the tree with his belt, all the objects he had thrown at the intruders were still lying around. Furthermore, there is the description of the strange, powerful gas, which plays such an important role in the story, as it does in the incidents related to Spring Hill Jack, the Johannes sighting, and the Sunny Desvergers case of August 1952. According to Captain Ruppelt's report of his investigation in Florida, Desvergers, a scoutmaster, found himself breathing the same peculiar gas when he entered a wood to investigate a strange light and faced, he said, a horrible being who looked at him from the turret of a flying machine unlike anything he had ever seen. He froze where he stood and noticed a small ball of red fire began to drift toward him. As it floated down it expanded into a cloud of red mist. He dropped his light and machete, and put his arms over his face. As the mist enveloped him, he passed out. This is confirmed by the unpublished memorandum written by Ruppelt on September 12, 1952, upon his return from West Palm Beach. Captain Ruppelt and Lieutenant R.M. Olson began their investigation on the morning of September 9. A conference was held with Captain Corney to determine whether or not there had been any late developments in this case that the two attic officers were not familiar with. Captain Corney stated that to his knowledge there was nothing outstanding that had happened. He was asked about the facts of supposedly anonymous threatening telephone calls that Mr. Desvergers had received. He stated that Desvergers had called him approximately two weeks ago and stated that he had been receiving anonymous threatening telephone calls while at work in the establishment in which he is employed. The gist of the calls was telling Desvergers to lay off of his story and that if he didn't he would be sorry and several other things. Not much attention was given to this claim, however, and Ruppelt continued his investigations by interviewing people who knew the scoutmaster and especially the members of the scout group who were with him in the car when he decided to go into the woods. He gave the boys instructions to go get help if he wasn't back in 10 minutes and started in the woods. The boys claimed that they could see his flashlight going back into the woods. From this point on, the boys' stories varied to a certain degree. The first boy states, he did not see the first light that Desvergis saw, However, shortly afterwards, after Desvergis had got out, made the statement about flying saucers, and got back into the automobile, he looked out of the window and saw a semicircle of white lights about three inches in diameter, sick, going down at an angle of 45 degrees into the trees. None of the other Boy Scouts saw this. He then states that he saw Desvergis go back into the woods and that the next thing that he saw was a series of red lights in the clearing. As soon as he saw the red lights he claims that he saw Sonny stiffen up and fall. 
According to two other boys, they both saw these vergers going through the woods, could see flashlights flashing on the trees and then disappeared for a few seconds, at least the light disappeared. The next thing they saw was a series of red lights. They said they looked a lot like flares or skyrockets. The lights were not making any definite pattern, some of them were going up, some of them going down, or going around and around in all directions. It just seemed to be a type of six or eight red lights going in all directions. This time they ran down the road to get help. Here we have confirmation of the red lights. The witnesses were not close enough, however, to experience the effects, but it is interesting to remark that the lights kept going around and around after the scoutmaster, according to his own account of the incident, was already unconscious. It is also interesting to note, in this connection, that over a century ago Larue de Lincey, in his Livre de Legende, had this to say about the elves, if a mortal being dares come near them, they open their mouth and, struck by the breath which escapes from it, the imprudent fellow dies poisoned. On October 7, 1954, Mr. Margine saw an object that had landed in a field in Monteau, France. It was shaped like a hemisphere, about two and a half yards in diameter. The witness gasped for air and felt paralyzed during the observation. The sudden lack of air noted in the Cisco Grove case is frequently reported by witnesses of landings, as are the peculiar eyes of the small entities, reddish-orange, glowing in the dark. On October 9, 1954, in Lavoux, Vienne, France, a farmer who was riding his bicycle suddenly stopped as he saw a figure, dressed in a sort of diving suit, aiming a double light beam at him. The individual, who seemed to have boots without heels, very bright eyes, and a very hairy chest, carried two headlights, one below the other, on the front of his suit. Nine days later, in Fontenay Torcy, also in France, a man and his wife reported that they saw a red cigar-shaped object in the sky. All of a sudden, it dived toward them, leaving a reddish trail, and landed behind some bushes. Upon reaching the top of a hill, the witnesses found themselves confronted by a bulky individual, human in appearance but only about three feet tall. He wore a helmet, and his eyes glowed with an orange light. One of the witnesses lost consciousness. Four other people saw the object in flight from another spot. A third group of independent witnesses in another town, Sense and Lapitary, saw the craft fly away west at tremendous speed. The countryside was illuminated over an area one to two miles wide. It is indeed appropriate to tell the investigator of such cases, in the words of Robert Herrick's The Night Piece of Julia, her eyes the glow warm in thee, the shooting stars attend thee, and the elf also, whose little eyes glow like the sparks of fire, befriend thee. The UFO occupants, like the elves of old, are not extraterrestrials. They are the denizens of another reality. This is the end of Dimensions, a casebook of Alien Contact Part 5. A book by Jacques Vallée. Please proceed to part 6, before YouTube deletes it. Thank you for listening.